I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. Our guest is George Berry, a noted political historian and public official, who is here today to talk with us about James Carmichael, a legendary figure in Georgia politics, whose name unfortunately is not mentioned nowadays, George. That's correct, Bob. It's not, and it should be. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, the library and and you have chosen to include him in this series because uh, he is one of those seminal figures in his day that uh, epitomized the New South movement and the New South thinking at a time when it was courageous to do so. And uh, it's, uh, it's too bad that he is not as well remembered as he should be. How and when did you get interested in the life and career of Jimmy Carmichael? Well, that's, uh, uh, growing up, uh, I grew up in the mountains of North Georgia, which at that time was an isolated area and a very poor area. And uh, I don't know exactly when it dawned on me as a boy that we could do better, that uh, Georgians had almost every gift that God could give a people, but yet we were the poor relation of this country. Franklin Roosevelt uh, was quoted uh, as saying that the single greatest problem, domestic problem, that the United States faced was Southern poverty. And uh, I began reading books at an early age and uh, it, it dawned on me that other states and other places were doing so much better than us with fewer natural resources than we had. And why was that? It, would, it became a lifelong fascination. And in thinking about this and studying about it and reading about it, I found that there were men, mainly, in those days, who saw it too and who advised us that we could do better and, and told us what we needed to do in order to do better. And of course, Henry Grady was the great original uh, articulator, if you will, of the New South movement, uh, which basically said, let's cut our ties to the past, uh, not out of any protest to the past, so let's honor the past, but let's focus on the future. Let's focus on education. Let's focus on economic development. Let's focus on upping the incomes of our citizens. And if we do, most of the problems we face will go away. And so I uh, began to look for people in that mold. And Jimmy Carmichael jumped out at me uh, in, in, in those early days as I looked at this. Carmichael was, uh, was a Cobb Countyan. He was born in uh, a little community called the Oakdale community, which is just uh, north of where Interstate 285 today crosses the Atlanta Road. Uh, his grandparents and his parents ran a store. In those days, there was a streetcar that ran uh, from uh, the center of Atlanta up to Marietta. Uh, rapid transit well ahead of its time. And uh, that store was the Carmichael Stop, it was called, on that, on that uh, streetcar line. And uh, he lived a fairly normal young life, uh, nothing that uh, would step sound out about uh, what was to come. But something happened to him in 1926. He was 16 years old. He was waiting for the streetcar uh, to take him to school in Marietta. And when the st he saw the streetcar coming, he ran across the road and was run over by a car. Uh, it mangled his legs broke his back. Uh, he never walked normally again. But as sometimes happens uh, in those situations, 
uh, it turned him into a, uh, an overachiever, uh, which he was for the rest of his life. Uh, in the first place was simply learning to walk again. Uh, with the help of his mother uh, and against the uh, expectations of his doctors, he actually did learn to walk in a way, uh, first with crutches uh, and then with a cane and, uh, and he was able to, to get around. Uh, he, he did things like learning to play the trumpet while he was in the bed uh, recuperating from this tragedy. Uh, and by the time he was a senior in high school, uh, he was able to drive a car uh, from his home up to Marietta to the high school where he was the president of his senior class. He founded the school newspaper, which still exists today. And, uh, and that was just sort of a model for the rest of his life. Uh, he, uh, he, he met every challenge and exceeded uh, what other boys uh, did uh, simply because of his determination. He became a lawyer. He did. He went to Emory University and uh, got his undergraduate degree and got his law degree. And uh, there he was pres president of his fraternity. He was in the band. He, 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 he was a big man on campus, essentially. Again, uh, uh, doing more than, than uh, most, most boys his age. Uh, and he went back to Marietta and hung out his shingle and became a lawyer and threw himself into the civic life of, of Cobb County and Marietta. He became, you know, a president of his Sunday school class. He became, uh, he became uh, head of the Red Cross. He became the president of the local civic club. And, and here's a, a, an amazing thing to me. Uh, when he was 26 years old, he was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives without opposition. Imagine a young man, 26 years old, and there must have been other ambitious political people in the county at the time, but he, he was so well respected and, uh, and, and such a personality that, uh, that he was able to get the nomination and become elected without anyone opposing him. And in two years later, he ran for re-election again without opposition, uh, which gives you some idea of, of the kind of person that he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in the late 30s. He refused to run, as I understand it, for a third term because of some ethical yes. question. He was, uh, he, he, by this time, his law practice was getting busy, and he represented a couple of clients which he thought might put him in a conflict of interest situation by representing those clients. So he declined to run for a third term in the General Assembly. Tell us about his uh, work on Rickenbacker Field. Well, uh, one of uh, his major activities was this question of bringing economic progress uh, to his home county. Cobb County in those days was rural. It, uh, it, it, it was on, you know, an older community, older than Atlanta actually, uh, Marietta is, uh, on the north side of, of, of uh, what is now the metropolitan area. But at that time, Cobb was just another rural county, primarily agricultural. And uh, Carmichael looked around, like I did in Blairsville, and said, we can do better than this. We don't need to have as many poor people. We don't need to have as many young people malnourished. We don't need to have as many babies dying. We need to have our people living longer. We need to have them making more money so they can enjoy, the, enjoy life, better education, and so forth. And so he threw himself into these, this idea of bringing economic progress to Cobb County, attracting industry. And in those days, uh, this is the New Deal period, and one of the uh, New Deal programs was this idea of developing airports around the country. And it happened to be administered 
by a certain General Lucius Clay. Uh, uh, the, the, it was administered under the U.S. Air Force, uh, or at that time the U.S. Army Air Corps. And of course, uh, Carmichael immediately pounced on this opportunity and got a grant to uh, build a landing field, as they were called in those days. And this is shortly after, after uh, uh, the, uh, what was Candler Field, the Atlanta landing field, was, was bought by the city of Atlanta. Uh, the effort was incidentally supported by the city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta was one of those people supporting the application for Cobb to get the money to build this landing field. And Eastern Airlines agreed to serve this landing field. And because they did, the uh, Carmichael and the people of Cobb County called it Rickenbacker Field. And, uh, but before Rickenbacker Field was completed, they got a bigger opportunity coming down the road. The uh, U.S. government, again General Clay having a part in this, uh, wanted to build aircraft manufacturing facilities inland so that they would not be subject to attacks by carrier-based airplanes and, and other things from the sea. So they were building these big plants uh, all throughout the central part of the country, the, in the Midwest and Southwest, but the one that was going to be in the Southeast was going to be uh, run by the Bell Aircraft Company of Buffalo, New York. And Mr. Lawrence Bell, Larry Bell, he was called, uh, was in charge of finding the site for defense plant number six, as it was called. Well, uh, Carmichael and his team, which included the mayor of, of Marietta, a man named Blair, uh, and the chairman of the county commission of Cobb County, they were not asleep at the switch. They again pounced on this opportunity. And Carmichael, again, showing the uh, tremendous charisma and the tremendous ability to relate to people that he had. It, it, uh, the contemporaries found it very hard to, to explain this. But he and Larry Bell hit it off. They became fast friends almost immediately. In fact, it was from Carmichael's law office that Larry Bell announced that they had chosen Rickenbacker Field as the site for defense plant number six. And of course that became Bell Aircraft, uh, which probably is the greatest economic cycle breaker that ever existed in the state of Georgia before or since. Uh, people uh, who were formerly farmers and formerly uh, ran whiskey stills uh, in the North Georgia mountains. Sawmill. Sawmills. Uh, were trained as metal workers, as machinists, and uh, the high point was uh, 26,000 people worked at the plant, uh, many of them women, and many of them, uh, by the way, were uh, uh, disabled people who uh, Carmichael took special pride in hiring because of his, his own disability. Uh, Carmichael became the general counsel to the plant uh, in competition, by the way, with some of Atlanta's biggest law firms. Again, going to his relationship with Bell, Bell chose his small law firm as the general counsel. And so Carmichael was heavily involved in the, in the beginning of the plant and the beginning of operations and, and so forth. And the first two uh, uh, general managers uh, uh, were, were hired by Bell to run the plant, and then the, 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 the manager in uh, 1944 was killed in an in a airplane crash, and Bell chose Carmichael to be the general manager. Now, now uh, Carmichael, while a very dynamic individual, had never run an enterprise like that. But it turned out that he was a, an outstanding chief executive officer. He was uh, 
known, uh, he had a little cart that he ran up and down the, the assembly line. And uh, the legend is, which is it's probably only a legend, that he knew the names of everybody who worked on the line. And he would go down the, the line, the cart, calling people's names. Uh, but, uh, but they built uh, uh, almost 300 B-29s, and uh, they built them efficiently. They had great safety records, and the plant, uh, he, uh, Carmichael got a presidential citation for his work at the uh, Bell Aircraft Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, later, Bell Aircraft became Lockheed. Yes, it did, as it is today. Right. Yes, same plant, same building. Let's talk a little bit now about his entrance into politics. He was a friend of Governor Arnold. Yes, he was. He was, uh, he was in the General Assembly, as I said, for two terms in the late 30s. Governor, Governor Arnold is uh, 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 Ellis Arnold from Noonan, Georgia. Uh, all, of, all of people, the people like Carmichael were excited about this young man, Ellis Arnold because he offered the first progressive New South uh, movement uh, policies that, uh, that they were hoping for. And uh, his administration was successful. 18-year-olds uh, were allowed to vote the first time in the United States that 18-year-olds were given the, the vote. The poll tax was abolished, which was a retrogressive type of a Thing. And he was fought in ev on almost every turn by the Talmages, led by Governor, former Governor Eugene Talmage, uh, head of the Talmage dynasty that lasted from 1926 to 1980 in the state. And uh, he, 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 the during during Arnold's administration, he called on Carmichael. He called on Carmichael to head the commission to rewrite the Georgia Constitution, uh, which was done, and he named him his revenue commissioner. Uh, so he, he did, a, he, he was very active in Governor Arnold's campaign. Well, the, US con the Georgia Constitution had, uh, had provided that there'd be a single four-year term. So Governor Arnold couldn't run, and Governor Talmadge was actively campaigning for his fourth time to be the governor of Georgia. The, uh, governor Talmadge had uh, caused the uh, accreditation of the University of Georgia, for example, to be lost. He had uh, done many other things that had gone against the New South movement and the economic progress of the city. He had turned his back on New Deal programs that would have brought progress to our state. And so there was a great deal of consternation about Talmadge being back in charge of the state after the four years of progressive administration of Ellis Arnold. They first tried to get the Constitution changed to allow Arnold to run for re-election. That failed. The Talmadge forces in the General Assembly failed, uh, caused that to fail. And uh, there was a search that took place uh, trying to get somebody in the Arnold mold to run for governor in 1946. They asked a number of people, and a number of people refused, and of course Carmichael was one of those, and he initially refused. But finally, in April of uh, 1946, he, he agreed to do it. He said, out of a sense of duty, is the way he put it. And uh, so I, I, I don't think that m Mr. Carmichael uh, ran for governor out of ego or out of desire, out of a desire to be governor. But I do think that he felt so strongly that the state was going to relapse and go back to its old ways that, uh, that he did it to keep economic progress going. And he wanted to use his experience in Cobb County as a template for the rest of the state, that if we chose to embrace economic progress, that we could do it. There was no reason we couldn't do it. And and he saw, he, he saw it happening in Cobb, and he said it can happen elsewhere in the state, and that's what he wanted to do. You refer to him as the man who should have been governor. Absolutely. In the first place, he won the popular vote. 
he beat Talmadge by some 16,000 votes. Uh, but we had uh, the county unit system, which I'm sure the viewers of this presentation will know about. Uh, it was a, uh, a system uh, that basically disenfranchised the most populous counties in the state and uh, gave uh, uh, tremendous power to the small rural counties of Georgia, of which we had many and still have many. But uh, he lost the, the election based on the county unit vote, a system, by the way, that was subse subsequently struck down by the courts uh, in 1962. Uh, and had it been in place in 1946, Carmichael would have been governor and should have been governor. And he should have been governor because of the views that he expressed. The, the political philosophy that he symbolized could have given Georgia a 16-year head start on getting us into the mainstream of the economic life of this nation. When we did start in 1962, 16 years after the 1946 campaign, we showed that everything Carmichael said we could do, we did. We began to close the gap on the national income to, 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 uh, to get ourselves out of the poor relation category and into equality with the rest of the nation. We, we, we began that march, some say in World War II with the coming of Lockheed and the military bases, but I, I count it as far as political leadership, I count it with the election of Carl Sanders, which was the first governor elected outside of the county unit system. And uh, the, the progress of Georgia since that time has been unprecedented, probably among any state in the Union. The progress, the economic progress that we have made as a state got a little way to go. We, we're not there yet, but we certainly proved Carmichael correct in his prediction that we could do it. And all we needed was the leadership. But instead, we got into a First of all, a controversy of actually who was the governor in 1946, which is an interesting story in itself. But then we went through the Herman Talmadge years, uh, and uh, Herman's uh, continued his father's, uh, he, was, he was more progressive than his father, Gene Talmadge, to be sure. But his main thrust in his administration was still maintaining our way of life, even though our way of life was characterized by poverty and ignorance. That was his major thrust as governor. And then the Marvin Griffin years, and then the transitional period of Vandiver, Ernest Vandiver, and then Carl Sanders. Mm -hmm. We could have started this progress in 1946 had J Jimmy Carmichael been elected governor. And that's why it's my position that he should have been governor. And Let's uh, go back, George, to that election. Uh, Eugene Talmadge won but died before he took office. And would you walk us through that process of the General Assembly electing the governor? The, the, uh, the Georgia Constitution uh, was somewhat vague. It, it was certainly not specific enough as to what would happen in that situation. And uh, like, you, like you say, uh, uh, Governor Eugene Talmadge won the county unit vote without question. And the Constitution said that if he were to die before taking office, that the General Assembly would elect from the next two vote getters in the general election of November 1946, who are in life and who would not decline the job. Well, Carmichael, uh, got something like 699 write-in votes, and that put him in second place in the, in the election. Now, uh, uh, remember, winning in those days, winning the Democratic primary was tantamount to winning the general election. And Talmadge got like 145,000 votes, you know, and uh, so essentially he was the only candidate in the race is the way things worked in those days. But 
certain people uh, felt so badly about Carmichael not winning and and uh, and so dissatisfied with the idea of a Talmadge becoming governor again that they wrote in Carmichael's name. And then there was a, a, a man from Elberton who ran sort of a quixotic campaign. His name was Talmadge Bowers. Many people think that he ran because he thought that he might confuse the Talmadge name. And uh, Talmadge Bowers uh, came in second with 600 and something votes. But uh, you, Herman Talmadge and his supporters knew that Eugene Talmadge was dying. He died of cirrhosis of the liver on, uh, in December of 1946. And as a result, they, acting on a, a tip from a merchant in Monticello, Georgia, who had read the Constitution, uh, they uh, got up an idea of writing in Herman's name. Herman was his father's campaign manager. And they did. Uh, we, in 13 counties in the state, uh, a few people uh, wrote in Herman Talmadge's name. But the problem was when they counted the vote that Herman was in third place. Third place. I, the number I, that I recall is 619 votes behind both Carmichael and this fellow Talmadge Bowers. Well, this was a rude shock to those people who thought that they had written in enough names for Herman that the General Assembly could choose him as governor. So as they were counting the votes, suddenly they got a message from Telfair County election officials that they had just found an envelope of write-in votes that they had failed to submit. There was 58 of them. The difficulty was that 34 of the last 34 on the list were in alphabetical order and appeared to be in the same handwriting. Plus, later investigation showed that some 14 uh, either swore that they had not voted uh, in the race or were out of the county at the time of the election and so forth. All of this was pointed out by the Atlanta Journal by a young reporter named George Goodwin, who later that year won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting of these outrages. Uh, so the issue turned on whether or not these votes were legitimate enough to put Talmadge into second place and therefore eligible to be elected by the General Assembly. Well, the General Assembly took it upon themselves to uh, 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 choose Herman, uh, which they did in January of uh, 1947. They elected Her Herman Talmadge, the son of Eugene Talmadge, uh, as governor of Georgia. and. Uh, at, when uh, that election took place, Herman and his crowd rather boisterously left their places up at the General Assembly and went down to the governor's office to get possession. There stood Governor Arnold refusing admittance. They battered the door down, went into his office. Uh, Arnold stood his ground, refused to cede the office to what he called the pretender. Herman Talmadge. And the next couple of days were absolutely chaotic. Georgia was on the front page of every paper in the nation. We became, you know, the butt of many, many jokes about the whole procedure. And uh, uh, finally, the uh, Georgia Supreme Court, uh, acting on a on a case that had been brought in the Fulton Superior Court. Uh, declared that the recently sworn in Lieutenant Governor, Melvin E. Thompson, M. E. Thompson, could hold the office of governor on an acting basis for two years until 1948, at which time there would be another general election. And that's what happened. Herman immediately began campaigning. 
uh, for that office, and when the time came, he easily defeated Mr. Thompson and became uh, the governor of Georgia in uh, 1948. Mr. Carmichael didn't object to that. No, he did not. Jimmy Carmichael refused to take part in it. He refused to be a part of it. He did not lift a finger. He, he probably knew that the General Assembly was stacked by Talmadge forces, but he also knew that, that uh, this was an almost comedy of errors type situation, bringing shame really to the, to the state. Uh, I mean, you didn't have to go far. The, uh, the, the, the stories uh, abound about, uh, one was that a young, a young boy was sitting on the fence crying down in Telfair County and someone asked him why he was crying and he said he saw in the paper where his grandfather had come back from heaven and voted in the election and didn't even stop by the house and say hello. Uh, another was that uh, when the uh, Herman Talmadge forces were out in the graveyard uh, finding all the dead people who voted, uh, four Talmadge wrote in uh, that uh, they were taking names and one of them says, okay, we got enough to get him in second place. And his buddy said, no, no, we're not leaving. The people over here on this side of the cemetery have got just as much right to vote as the people on that side. <laughs> so these, these were the kind of things which were funny in a way, but Georgia for too long had confused its entertainment with its politics and got us 48th, 49th, and or in those days, 48th place in most of the statistics of progress. And uh, so in the end, it was not funny at all. Carmichael put forth a very progressive platform that included uh, moderation in race relations. Yes. That was not the thing that was usually done in Georgia at that time. It was not. And of course, he was facing one of the great demagogues in Southern political history, if not U.S. political history. And Herman Talmadge was quick to, or Eugene Talmadge rather, was quick to pounce on this saying that he was for mixing of the races, which was a death knell almost uh, in those days. And uh, it was the, the intimidation uh, factor. The white primary had been uh, declared illegal by the courts by that time, but there was, a, uh, there, there, there was an overt effort by the Talmadge forces to intimidate black voters from going to the polls. The FBI actually issued a report that said that we've investigated uh, this situation and we find that there is a conspiracy to intimidate, physically intimidate black voters to go into the polls and we have traced it back to the Talmadge political headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. There were there were wholesale purges of black voters who had registered during the Arnold years. Uh, uh, Board of Registrars in rural counties would simply send summonses out to all their black voters, no whites, just black voters. They would have to come to the courthouse. They would be questioned on uh, what the uh, 17th Amendment to the Constitution says and other such questions. At the same time, there'd be white voters who couldn't even read or write that would be not challenged at all. And so it was a, and, and of course all this was covered by the press. I think it was, I think it was during those years that uh, Eugene was on the cover of Time Magazine and uh, he and Huey Long were making noises about, uh, you know, taking over the country. And uh, it was a sad time in our state's uh, history. and. What I admire about Carmichael, and what people today should admire about Carmichael, is he had the guts to take them on. He had the guts to stand up in a time when it took tremendous courage to do so. Well, that uh, that ended his quest for public office, yes. but it didn't uh, it didn't end his community and his political dealings. No, it did not. Uh, Carmichael went on to become president of Scripto, which uh, in those years was uh, probably the major manufacturer of writing instruments in the country, if not the world. Big plant in, 
in Atlanta. But he also, uh, as was his custom throughout his life, he threw himself into the civic life of the, of the city. And uh, the, today we enjoy the Woodruff Art Center in Atlanta, where all of the arts organizations of the city are housed under one governance, under one fundraising plan. This was, this was Jimmy Carmichael's idea. He was, he was the first head of this organization. He was on the board of directors of companies like uh, uh, Georgia Power and, and uh, the Trust Company, Bank, and major companies of, of this kind. Uh, he served as the, uh, one of the first chairman of the Board of Industry and Trade for the state. He had tremendous energy uh, for a man who, again, as it turned out later from letters that we've seen, uh, suffered pain every day. Uh, with his, uh, as a result of his, of his injury at age 16. Uh, Mr. Robert Woodruff, who was the chairman of, of the Coca-Cola Company, he called himself the chairman of the executive committee, was his official title, uh, tried his best to get Jimmy Carmichael to be the, chair, the, the president and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. And uh, I went through his papers, which are housed at Emory University, and Carmichael's letters back to Mr. Woodruff are masterpieces in politely declining to do it and giving the reason the only time I found ever that he mentioned his illness, but he said uh, that he got up every morning with pain and suffered pain every time he moved and that uh, in, a, in a company like Coca-Cola, which would require so much traveling and, and so forth, that he didn't feel like that he was up to it. Uh, but that's the only time. But it tells you something about Carmichael, that the premier businessman of this state, Mr. Woodruff, would look to him as someone who would lead his company. And in every situation that Carmichael ever had, ever experienced. He was looked to. He was the man. He, he, he could light up a room. He, could, he had a way of relating to people. He had a way of getting people's confidence. He had a way of convincing people to his way of thinking. He had a way of commanding loyalty that, uh, as you read contemporary accounts about him, uh, people, even close friends, had trouble articulating this. They had, they had trouble describing this special quality, which we might call charisma, or other words, but which don't adequately convey the kind of man that he, that he was. Finally, George, uh, he was one of the first people to really stand out for a, stand up for a two-party system in Georgia. Yes, he did. He thought, he thought the single party system that we had was bad for our state, held us back, um, and uh, it's, so we've gone from a one-party state to a one-party state in a way. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sure he'd probably be disappointed by that. Do you but, think if he were alive today he would be a Georgia Republican? No, I have a feeling that he'd be one of the traditionalists, uh, uh, mainly because his uh, progressive enlightened views on race, and uh, I, I think he'd still be hanging with the Democratic Party, and uh, he'd be working to make it a more inclusive uh, party, I think. That would be my guess as to. Well, George, yeah. I want to thank you for being with us today and for enlightening us on the life and the career of uh, Jimmy Carmichael. Thank you, Bob.